Hey, fellow workers, welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are a member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. My name is Kim Seaver. I'm the host. You are tuning into episode seven of season one of the Alberta Worker Podcast. And I am happy to announce that today's guest is Rio Lance, a student with University of Canada West. Welcome, Rio. Thank you for having me, Cam. My pleasure. So let's get straight into it. How about you tell us your life story? You know, where you were born and grew up and what your family was like, where you might have gone to school, that sort of thing. And then as you're doing that, just include your personal labor history, your first job, second jobs, which is up to now, that sort of thing. Okay, perfect. So I grew up in a small town called Pembroke, Ontario. It's in Ontario, uh, which is about an hour east of Ottawa. I lived there basically until I was nine years old and then my family my parents moved me and my sister out here to Calgary uh, and and I've lived in Calgary ever since. Um, I'm also a member of Algonquin from the Greater Golden Lake which is also um, makes up a good portion of the southern part of Ontario and then a good chunk of Quebec as well. I have relatives actually on both both sides. I have grandparents that lived on the reserve on the Quebec side in Chapeau which is uh, about a half an hour 40 minute drive away from Pembroke. When it comes to my Indigenous side, that's definitely part of of who I am. I've lived in Calgary since I was nine. So when it comes to my work, I've always worked in Alberta. I've always worked in Calgary. I've mostly only spent maybe 10, 15 years in retail, but also uh, about a good portion of those years in management roles as well. Assistant uh, store manager. Uh, I've been store managers before, um, key holders, supervisors. So I've been in a lot of the management roles. And then only recently, probably in the last five years or so, I've just actually been working. I've completed my my bachelor's in commerce last year in March, and now I'm working on my master's. And then my goal actually is to get my doctoring next year because I'm actually working towards becoming um, a university professor. So when it comes to the work part of that, that's where I kind of want my school to go. Cool. That's a quick story. Um, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I totally get that. Uh, my spouse it just finished up a master's degree last summer and is looking to work on a PhD as well because there's no work in academia yep. for people with just a master's degree. Even sessional instructors now, they pretty much require you to have a PhD. You know, a decade ago, it was easy to get a, a job as a sessional if you had a master's degree. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the thing is, I've been noticing to a lot of jobs that I would be interested in, such as HR, they're paying them 15. I've seen some posts where they're paying HR, uh, you know, reps, 15 to $16 an hour, but you need to have a master's or a bachelor's. And I'm like, whoa, that's really sad. Oh my that goodness. They're, that they're paying those roles minimum wage, but they still expect all that education at the same time. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's so funny. Like it's so funny. They can't see that, that they expect someone with two university degrees to be making minimum wage. It's like, well, yeah. what do you think people with no post-secondary education to be making? It makes no sense to me. Well, and then they expect you to pay, you know, 700 to a thousand dollars or more a month to pay back your student loans. And if you're making minimum wage, I'm not sure how somebody can do that yeah. while paying, while paying all the other things on top of it, right? Like your, right. your rent, your mortgage, all your utilities, your groceries, all that stuff. So the jobs in Alberta have gotten almost like they lost their common sense that, oh, we're going to pay you minimum wage, but you need to have a doc, uh, a master's or a bachelor's in order to get this job too so yeah and actually by the time this episode comes out i'll already have published a story on the alberta worker regarding that the majority of the job growth in alberta over the last i think it's actually during the ucp's term has been retail yeah. jobs it's yep. like it's yep. so ridiculous they keep yep. they keep saying oh yeah we got sixty thousand new jobs in alberta yeah but they're almost all retail they're, like, they're which is excited. fine like retail workers they're still legitimate jobs but i mean they don't pay very well they're often just part-time hours and it's hard to live off of so it's not the it's not the job itself that is problematic yeah it's like what they give you for doing the labor yeah exactly it's it's like they're patting themselves on the back for all these jobs but like you said they're all retail jobs so it's kind of no wonder why i've been 
and hearing from other people um, and their words, not mine, that they're choosing to leave Alberta for other provinces or even other countries because the job market or the jobs they went to school for is just not there or they're expecting them, you know, paying them $30,000 a year and expect them to live on that when, you know, when they have all that education and they probably have, you know, mountain debt of student loan on top of it. So I don't really blame them really because what else do you do, right? Like why go for a minimum hour job when you went to school to get all the education? Yeah, exactly. And so you're in school now working on your MBA. Are you working at the same time or you're focused primarily on your studies? I'm I'm just focusing on my on my MBA. The other thing I'm doing, which you probably know, and a lot of people that follow me on Twitter know, but even people in the community, I am planning to run for in politics too. So I am working on that. But that's sort of like obviously not a job, but it is still something I'm working on on top of, of doing my schooling as well. Okay, cool. And are you running for a particular party? And which election are you hoping to run in? Well, I was actually hoping to run provincially, but things are sort of changing in my life right now. I'm actually planning to run federally, but I'm both, I was actually planning to run as an independent provincially, but I'm actually still staying independent, but I'm just going to do that on a, on a federal scale. Um, I just feel that the political party system is failing us. And I just, the more I know who I am, the more who I represent for myself I just feel that being an independent is is a better role for me and I just what has worked for centuries or a century and a half I guess in Canada I feel it's not working now and I think we just need to move past the whole us versus them mentality that's kind of where I'm standing when it comes to that twinsies I know. <laughs> I mean, some maybe not all of my listeners will realize this, but I did run in the last federal election in September 2021 yeah. as an independent as well. Hence the comment I made. <laughs> cool. So um, what was your first job? So my very first job was probably at Calgary Co-op. Um, and that was all the way back in 2005, 2006. And what were you doing there? I was the grocery person, the one who brought your groceries to your car. And then I also got went to cashier school and became a cashier. So I basically just did very basic stuff there. I was in high school at the time too. So it was like a job while I was in high school. So sure, like evenings, a weekends kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So cashier school. Is that something co-op provided or that's something you went somewhere else to do? Um, co-op provided that. I don't know if they still do it, but um, at the time, if you wanted to become a cashier, you had to go uh, to cashier school, which was basically at one of their head offices here in Calgary. And you spent like, I think it was just one weekend. You spent like a whole weekend and they just trained you all the different codes and gave you pretty much every possible scenario they could think of that could, that could happen at the, at the register. So... Oh, interesting. I don't think I've ever yeah. heard of something like that. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you just kept staying in retail after that, you say? Yeah. And then I just stayed in retail after that. So I worked at companies like Staples. I worked at Office Depot until they shut down completely in Canada. And then I I didn't work for a little while. I got a big severance from Office Depot. So I didn't work for probably like, I would say three to six months-ish. And then I basically went into other companies like Mark's or Warehouse, uh, Roots. Sketchers was actually my last job. So I was actually um, an assistant store manager and the stock manager at Skechers. So that was the last job I had all the way back in 2016. And then I went back to school in the fall of 2016. So that was sort of like just different companies that I went through and it was entry levels and then eventually more into like key holders, supervisors, and then manager roles. Cool. And are you an only child? No, I have a younger sister. What is she up to at the moment? So she's pretty much a stay-at-home mom. She has two kids. I have a niece and nephew. Her husband works full-time. I forget what company he works for, which is probably bad to admit, but he works full-time. I know she works at Blackfoot. It's a motorcycle um, company here in Calgary. She works there um, like one or two evenings a week and then Saturday. So she does part-time and then, yeah, she's a full-time mom the rest of the time. So. All right. And then your parents, what did they do or do they do? Um, my mom works for uh, CBI. It's a health clinic. What she's doing actually right now is she helps people who are currently on workers comp. Basically, they're on workers comp, but they're ready to go back into the work field. So she helps them uh, like utilize the schools they have and based on the injuries that they that they had, tries to find um, work and jobs that, and careers that they're able to do going back in, into the workforce. And then my dad works for um, his friend's company, which is just basically fixing different fi like alarms 
systems throughout different buildings and stuff throughout the city. Great. All right. So um, did you do your undergrad at University of Canada West as well? Yes, I did. Okay, cool. So sticking with the university, is that where you're planning to do your PhD? No, they don't have a PhD. Actually, I wasn't planning to do my master's there. I was actually planning to do it um, at the uh, university in London, UK, oh. but um, but my student loans didn't get approved for it. So I just ended up going back to this school for my master's. I do have a couple schools in mind that are also in the UK or even in the US for my, so it's a doctoring in business administration, but a DBA is similar to a PhD. It's just, it's a new program that they've added. It's still the same level as a PhD, but I don't have like a specific school I'm interested in yet. So I'm just sort of like looking out there and just sort of feeling what schools are out there. So. Okay, cool. Great. Yeah. All right. So I think that probably covers everything regarding the personal labor history and your life story. So then next question I have for you is how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And that could be ethnicity. I mean, you did say you're indigenous. So it could be ethnicity. It could be sexual orientation. It could be disability or religion or whatever else. Ways that society has marginalized you and how that might have influenced your experiences as a worker. Well, I think once people find out I'm indigenous, I don't, it's not usually something I like actively go out and say a lot of times to people, but I find when people find that part out, it's almost like a different attitude. It's almost like they expect me to be a certain way because society has painted what a majority of indigenous people look like. So it's almost like they thought I had an alcohol problem, for example. I mean, this was probably years ago, but I know it still happens to other indigenous people who I've even spoken to. So the fact that that comment still comes out of uh, managers' uh, mouths is is a little baffles me because I don't really know how to respond to that when when that is something that that is has been said to me. It's been said to me probably only a couple of times. Um, I know people it's been said to more, but I can't really say I know how to react to that because it's like I mean I can say it's upsetting that that's still something that's being said, but society really has a hard time like adapting to Indigenous people. It's we're almost on the back burner, and you know Indigenous women is especially are at the bottom of society and I really don't even know like it, it's hard it's a really hard topic for me in some ways because I don't know what the right solution would be for companies to go like being more diverse is is as amazing when companies do it but I, I think need, there needs to be more training and education obviously but if that's people's reaction to that I'm not going to say the company but I had to leave a job because of my sexuality and and just not feeling welcomed. Uh, it wasn't really so much being bullied. It was just more just be, being treated differently. And I could feel it. I could feel the, the attitude the managers had towards me or even some of the staff. So I ended up leaving, leaving that company. And I only like probably worked for the company, you know, not very long, but it was enough for me to know that, you know, even sex, even people's people, sexuality is a problem for managers. You know, this was in 2014 when this happened. So, I mean, I know it's getting better, but uh, when you're Indigenous and you're also 2S, it's like a double whamming in the work uh, industry, I think. And yeah, that would be probably some examples I can think of that have affected me personally in the workforce. Sure. And so you're Two-Spirit? Yeah, so I identify as Two-Spirit, for okay, sure. Cool. I didn't realize that. Nice. <laughs> um, okay, so you're yeah. saying that management was saying stuff like this to you? Yes, this is management. I don't want to like say it's just because it's retail, but it was management and retail. I, I still don't think that's an excuse for that to be said. But yeah, it was management people who said it. It was st some staff too. Like the two times it happened, it was in different companies. It was management that was asking that or not really asking it, but more like, oh, we thought you would have an alcohol problem. Like, you know, we think, or they're like, don't a lot of Indigenous people have alcohol problems? So it was a statement, but a question, but something that like I couldn't really comprehend that why that was even a question anyways just because I revealed that I was you know an indigenous person yeah and so the fact that it happened at more than one company should be like these aren't isolated events right this is probably a systemic issue and then you made another comment about how you know we probably need to work on more you know equity and more inclusion and, and diversity in the workplace as well and then you had said something else 
I don't remember exactly what it is, but it was basically how we need to do more than that. And yeah, I mean, because I mean, you can hire a lot more indigenous people, but if you don't change your attitudes, it's still not going to be a more welcoming environment. You're just going to be offending more people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And I think that probably training, you know, is important too for management. You know, the fact that, that those comments were coming from management, that lets me know that this isn't just like a training thing for like a regular staff member. This is a training level that needs to be taken um, on all levels um, in a corporation or a company. Right. And again, my stories are not just isolated stories. I know that other Indigenous people could probably tell you similar stories or even, even you know, more horrifying stories of questions that they get asked when, you know, people know that they're Indigenous. And I really wish we can move past it, right? But, you know, it's how society is too. Like, look at how when everyone was defining out about the unmarked graves, for example, it was so much attention because the media was putting so much attention. Now they're still finding these these unmarked graves and nobody's talking about them. And again, it's media's fault and it's the government too. They just want to like act like this is something, okay, we care. We'll talk about it for, you know, a week or a couple of days or whatever. And then we'll move on to something else. And then they pat themselves on the back. Well, we, we talked about it. We mentioned it just mentioning it a couple times doesn't like fix everything yeah right? you can't expect us to talk about it for a year no absolutely but <laughs> no, i mean that's what that's what they're thinking yeah exactly absolutely that's what they're thinking right so oh more grace oh we got to talk about this again yeah exactly so because of those examples lead by example the you know, companies are just leading by example because their leaders or their politicians are, you know, doing what they're doing, right? But this isn't just Indigenous. This is, you know, this is across the board for, for everyone that is a person of color or, you know, so it's a definitely an issue on a bigger, on a big scale, but it's just unfortunate that that's how, you know, media works and, and our government stuff works, right? So... Yeah, I mean, you'd think the way, looking at the media, that Black boys aren't getting accosted by cops anymore. Right. But it's it's yeah, still yeah, happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's a picture they paint. Right. I, I was actually at the Canada Day powwow here in um, on Canada Day. Um, my partner was actually he actually is the one who was hosting that event with the city of Calgary. But um, I had an Indigenous lady come up to me and she we were talking about this. It's ironic. And it was she was saying it's kind of like to them, it's if they don't see it or if it's kind of like out of their mind, it's not happening. Right. And that's exactly what is going on with media. Right. It's let's just act like it's over there. We can't see it. So it must not be happening. Right. So. And the only way they see it is if there's protesting. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If somebody takes a video of a cop beating up a black kid and then uploads it to social media, the media doesn't care about it. But when people start yeah. protesting about what happened in that video, then the media starts. That, that's when it's newsworthy is when the black people are all angry. Yeah. Not when the yeah. black people are being, you know, violently oppressed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exa exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really too bad that that's where we are in our society at the moment. In 2022, that we still have so much racism not like obvious blatant racism, but so much subtle race racism as well. Like some of the things you were talking about, those, those comments that managers and, and fellow coworkers were making weren't a thing in the past. Like those things are still happening to people. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, exactly. it's just so sad that we're still in that, in that place that no matter how much people try to educate one another and try to make a difference and point out why things are wrong that people are saying it's, it still persists. And the, yep. the very fact that people think that, you know, the majority of Indigenous people have an alcohol problem is because the majority of people they see with alcohol problems are Indigenous. They're, they're getting it backwards. And by see, I mean like portrayed, not yeah, necessarily, yeah. The, but like they'll go to, to a party and everybody there might be white, for example, and they don't think anybody there has an alcohol problem, but... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and even with my education, I'm the first one in my family to get a bachelor's. So obviously, I'll be the first one to get a master's and the first one to go and get my doctoring. So it's a nice feeling. But it's also again, how how society treats Indigenous people, right? Like, it's even like when I tell people I get student loans, they're like, really? Like, they, they all think that the government is handing me all this money to do all this stuff. And I'm like, um, the government has never cared about Indigenous people. So 
why would they just start giving us money for no reason? So even just that shows me how, how we still have far way to go because they assume that the government gives us money on everything. And I know, yes, the government does give Indigenous people money and they see that, but they think that money is always being given to us. I see comments online all the time. Oh, well, not for me personally, but I see people say, oh, well, they're Indigenous, they're getting money from the government or, and that's why they're alcoholics and and all this stuff. So it just goes to show you, like you said, it's 2022 and we're still, we still have people thinking like that. For some things, you just have to sit and think about it for a moment and realize how ridiculous how ridiculous it sounds. Like this yeah. idea that Indigenous people get free education. If that were the case, how come you're the first person in your family to get a bachelor's degree? Exactly, right? Like that's that's the thing. Like if that's the case, if I'm if we got free education, there should be more people, not just in my family, but there should be more Indigenous people with with bachelors or masters or doctor doctorings, right? So that's why you know it shows the um, how people really aren't educated on that stuff, right? I saw it at the powwow, just people coming in. I I was in charge of the teepees, so I was with a lot of the elders and they would tell their stories and stuff and just seeing how sorry to say but seeing white people (laughs) coming in and and some of the questions they ask if they just sat back and realized um, what they were asking they would sort of realize how ridiculous it is like one example I can think of is is a lady asking an elder um, where she was from so she told her that she's originally from Saskatchewan well another elder was about to come in to do to do the next speaking and that same lady is like oh are you from Saskatchewan too just like almost this mind frame thinking that you know even indigenous people only come from a certain area so it's sad because like we that's why there's all these treaties all these treaties are not just in one spot they're all over Canada so it's it just shows me how how people still aren't recognizing even something like that but if they were to just sort of like take a step back and recognize what they just said they probably would realize wait this question is probably not really important I guess yeah like I used to clean carpets for a living. I did that for about a year. One of the first jobs I had in Lethbridge and I had a pretty racist boss. One time we went and cleaned carpets, but we were scheduled to go clean carpets at a house on one of the reserves. I think it was the Picani reserve. There was nobody home when we got there. We were based out of Lethbridge. And so like, it was about a, quite a bit of time out of our day, you know, probably an hour's worth of driving time, maybe a little bit more. And so he was pretty ticked off about that. But then as a result, he ended up implementing a surcharge for any job on the reserve after that. And he would make the homeowners meet us in Lethbridge, and then we would follow them back to their place. And he never did that with white people. Like white people w- wouldn't be there when we show up and he never created a white person sh- surcharge, right? It was just the people on the reserve. And so one time we went out, people came and met us in Lethbridge, totally fine and drove us out there and we followed them all the way there. And then while we are cleaning their, their carpets, or maybe it was afterwards and we're squaring up with them and giving them their invoice and stuff, he asked the, the fellow who is there, what he does for a living. And he says, oh, I work at this school. And remember, this is the school on the reserve. And he asks him, oh, are you the janitor? It's a reserve school. Most of the <laughs> teachers, if not all of them, are going to be indigenous. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Blackfoot. It was like, what? So you think yeah. he's, because he's indigenous, he has to be the janitor? It's like, oh my goodness. As you were talking, I was wondering, you know, maybe the reason why this racism continues to persist is that it's just easier for people to believe tropes and stereotypes they hear rather than taking the time and the effort to see if the things they're hearing are true. Like this yeah. idea of getting your education paid for. Yeah, it's true the government provides money for education for Indigenous people, but not enough for every Indigenous person. Um, no. And so, you know, maybe it's it just takes time and effort to research that and find out the answer to those those stereotypes. And it's just easier to believe the stereotypes and tropes. I wonder if that's just, you know, plays a big part of it. Well, the thing is, too, is it's funny you say that because like these people, these same these same people who don't want to do the research, what's ironic about it is they'll Google anything else, you know, whether it's like health related, like if they have a health question about themselves, they'll Google it, you know, they'll Google anything that they 
might find important. But yet when Indigenous people are basically saying, you know, you can read the TRC by Googling it, it, it just baffles me that suddenly they don't know how to use Google. They don't know how to search this stuff. But yet when it comes to health or anything personal for them, they have no problem searching for that online. But yet the Indigenous stuff and probably like you said, being lazy, they just don't want to do it. But like literally you Google everything else. So I don't get why all of a sudden you can't Google something like that. My view as an Indigenous person is uh, like, especially being a younger Indigenous person, I, I'm open to to meeting people halfway and in creating that bridge. I find, you know, older Indigenous people don't want to do that per se. But when it comes to very basic tools like Google, <laughs> um, you know, we shouldn't have to like educate people how to do something like that. Like you do it for everything else. So it's online. You just have to Google it and re read it. But they think that we should be the ones that read it to them or we should be the ones telling them what it says but you know the whole point of that was created for those people to read that we're the ones that created it, but well not I'm not I didn't create a GRC but indigenous people created it is what I mean so they they should at least meet us halfway like I'm saying and at least read it or at least you know search that information um, and understand what that's about yeah that's a really good point They'll sit there and they'll watch an hour documentary on how September 11th was an inside job, or they'll spend 30 minutes, you know, research or reading through uh, an academic paper that was published in a peer reviewed, but very sketchy um, journal about ivermectin and being a, a cure for yeah. COVID-19 or whatever, but they can't take, you know, 10 minutes to learn about the funding that goes towards education for indigenous people or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. That's probably a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, it, it's, it, it baffles me, but like I said, that's again, probably they're lazy and again, they, or they just, again, they want everything handed to them, but like society has already handed so much to, to white people. I have white people in my family too. So, I mean, I get it, but like, there's only so much much I can do to meet people halfway on stuff. You know, if they're not willing to do the work, then this is what continues to set us back because they just want us to give hand feed them basically all this information but that's not how life should work all the time because it hasn't worked that way for indigenous people for a long time so at least they can do is read stuff like that like you said so yeah i totally agree we should find ways to be able to learn more about the areas where we have more an advantage or more privilege than other people so non-indigenous people should learn more about the struggles that indigenous people have to go through or you know try and do the research to see if the things that we're hearing can be debunked or if they already have been debunked and to find out what the real facts are and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? I think final thoughts, I would say, you know, definitely be more open-minded to Indigenous people. Uh, don't be so stereotypical of, of an Indigenous person. Um, I think, honestly, if if more companies hired more Indigenous people, and also, I think, um, incorporating, and I know some companies are doing it, but I, I hope other companies, you know, consider it, incorporating land um, acknowledgement uh, as well in, in their statements or, um, you know, when they're doing events and stuff I think having more of that would be would be awesome um I, like I said I do I do know some companies are doing it but if more companies do it I just think that it just shows we're on that right direction so yeah I think that would be something I would just say as one of my final thoughts cool thank you and You're if welcome. people are interested in you know learning more about you and reading more of the things you have to say do you have like socials or like a blog or website or anything that you'd uh, like to plug so at this time so currently I'm only using Twitter, but uh, my handle is uh, cure, 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 um, Queer Native YYC. I don't know why that was so hard for me to say. Um, so you can find me on there. And eventually once um, we get closer to a federal election, I'll definitely have a website. I'll make sure I will post, I'll, I'll probably post it on Twitter for people to find. I don't use Facebook right now for anything outside of personal, but eventually I'll have a Facebook for all my campaign stuff too. So yeah, right now Twitter's the only way to really reach me at the moment. Okay, great. And I'll be sure to include your Twitter handle in the description of the podcast as well. If awesome. people are interested 
interested in learning more about Alberta Worker, you can follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. Once you're there, you can also listen to all of our past podcast episodes, and you can subscribe to our newsletter. We have a daily, weekly, and monthly email newsletter. If you like this podcast, please rate, review, and support it. Reminder that the Alberta Worker Podcast is a member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. If you're interested in being a guest on our show, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca. Thank you, Rio, for joining us. Thank you to all the listeners for listening in today. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>